I only have one introduction slide, so it's not um, a, a theory session. It's more like practical stuff. Um, and the reason is that um, I'm, I'm, I really like coding, but I'm not really a C++ guy. This is why David is going to help me out with some more realistic C++ examples. But still, it, it's not really a language um, focus session. It, it's more about the concepts and what we're going to do with uh, system threading and the classes in there. So, well, the idea is um, why would we do uh, multi-threaded applications at all? Um, when we started all the application de development with Delphi 1 and uh, all the other versions we are using and we started doing uh, desktop applications, probably most of us didn't even care about multi-threading because, well, applications just worked, whatever you did. You just um, clicked the uh, interface together, you created an interface um, when the user pressed the button and it took a while, well, you, you conditioned your users just to wait for um, the events to happen, to, to see the results and, well, it, it might take a while and the users got, no, got known to it and they usually got a cup of coffee if, if something just took a while. Well, now that we are going to use or going to build more mobile and cross-platform applications, um, well, the scenario is a little bit shifting now. So when building mobile applications and you implement something that will take a while, something that where the user taps on, on a button like this here, so the user usually expects something to happen instantly. If it takes a second or two, he might get nervous. He might even kill your application. And if even if the user says, well, that's fine, it takes a while, it might still be the uh, operating system, so iOS or Android kicking in and deciding, well, this application is not responsive, so we, met, we better kill it off the system. So having an application that takes a while while hitting on a button and waiting for a result is not acceptable in the mobile world. But it's not really just for mobile applications. We all know the situation in our desktop applications where you hit a button, we, we, we conditioned our users to just wait, but it's still inconvenient. You see um, in the title of the applications, even sometimes in Delphi, application is not responding. This is usually the case when you're when you hit a button, hit an event, and it takes a while to process. So you, you're basically blocking the main thread. It's all about just having one thread doing all the work. The main thread is the thread that communicates to your users. It displays the uh, user interface. So if you block the main thread, the user interface is basically stop. It, it just doesn't do anything anymore. And in, in Windows, we see that well, application is not responding, you might get the white ghost window and stuff like that. So this is something we really want to avoid and we should even avoid that on uh, desktop applications. So um, what I'm going to show here is basically an application as a demo, which is a cross-platform application. So it would run on Windows, iOS, and Android. And it's actually the walkie-talkie demo application that I um, used for my other um, presentation yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday. And uh, it's the uh, walkie-talkie app. So it's technically an application where you can send some um, text messages to other users having the same application. So it's a, some sort of a chatting application. Um, we are using... Um, parse in the background to implement all this stuff. The details um, I showed in, in the other application about building a parse or push enabled application. So don't worry about the details about parse in, in, in this demo. This demo is purely about showing how to deal with operations that take a little while. So maybe just let's start the application and see what happens. I'm going to show just a Windows application here in, in this demo because it shows everything we need to know. It, it behaves the same way in, um, on the uh, mobile platforms. So under target platforms, we just uh, select 32-bit Windows here and we run the applications. And now 
take a look what happens. So the application runs and you see a white screen. This white screen basically tells me there is something happening in the background. And here's the, the actual user interface. So for whatever reason, the application took a while to start up. And this while, this little while, is basically something that shouldn't delay the display of your user interface. So we are doing something that blocks the user interface. That's the reason why uh, the application took a while to actually display the, um, the, the user interface. Here in that application, the messages you see is basically the history of chat messages or some part of it that was generated through um, the application. So I can basically send messages here, um, something um, from walkie-talkie, and it sends it to all connected devices. This is a Windows application, so it will only allow you to send push notifications. It doesn't receive them. This is something I explained on the other um, session. The, the actual interesting thing is now I send a broadcast, something from walkie-talkie. Well, excuse my um, <laughs> type was in here. And to see the history, the actual message, because I don't receive that message as a push notification, for that reason we have a refresh button. And this refresh button is now what I'm going to press here again. So I press the button. It takes a while. The button keeps blue. I can't do anything. The user interface is stalled. And now we see the update. So from some source, it now displays the uh, last message I just sent, something from walkie-talkie. So let's have a look into the application, what, what's going to happen here. Um, so we have the refresh button, and we have, of course, the form. Uh, let's go back to the form and its event. So we have a form show event. Uh, just ignore the start pushes, push services um, line here. It's all about refresh chat history. This is a procedure that is called also from the um, uh, refresh button. So this is the procedure which executes codes that takes a while. So let's have a look. So this is basically code we use to write uh, when we were basically not aware of any performance or blocking the UI issues. So this is traditional code in some way. So I have uh, a um, data module main get chat history. So this is basically firing off a query against parse to get me all the last um, chat, his, uh, chat messages that I sent to the system. And if, if an error happens, like uh, internet connection broke or something, we just display a status and that's it. Once we receive chat history, well, we go through UI code to basically update the user interface. So this is good code, this part. It, it just takes the result, processes it, and displays it. It, it should go reasonably fast. So this is not the problem. The problem is in here. The problem is this code. This may take a while. Why? Why does it? Well, let's have a look. So in here, we do have get chat history. I separated everything on, on the business code out to a um, data module. And here we have um, basically code that goes to parse. This is parse, back and storage storage, query objects, and then just, um, well, ask for everything of class chat message. So get me all the chat messages, um, order them descending, and limit it by eight entries. And fill it basically back into the L chat history uh, user variable. And for the purpose of, well, showing that this might take a while. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm on a really fast network right now, so the delay is still minimal for me. I inserted a five-second delay, an artificial delay down here. If you're on a mobile device and if you're in a bad network situation, you might end up with Edge or even worse with GPRS, and that really may slow down your whole server communication. So. To summarize, we are connecting to a server, and that server might respond. Uh, actually, it's down here. The server might 
the server communication might take a while. This is the reason why this is a bad operation to execute in the user interface or, or in the context of threat that drives the user interface. That's what we're doing here. So we need to think about exactly that. Um, how to deal with the situation that this takes a while. Usually, or in, in past times, it would, would be something like that. You realize this takes a while and, well, you're going to ask maybe David. Well, because David is someone you know, he knows how to do, how to deal with threats, how to create a T-threat class or a descendant of T-threat, uh, implement the execute procedure and stuff like that. It's something that the uh, regular developer often, well, try to avoid creating a class, a, th a threat class, start the, start the uh, threat, and, well, have all the magic run around and, and make this work. In Delphi XC5, there was a new uh, namespace added called System Threading. That's what we're going to use now. And I'm going to show you how to simplify stuff with using or by using uh, system threading. So it's this system threading. System threading comes with a bunch of new classes, and we are using a couple of them in this demonstration. So let's move up to something I prepared. So the, my, the first thing you might um, come across would be possibly uh, a future. You might have read about a future. A future is something uh, which is declared in a uh, class named ttask. So you might have the idea to use a future to execute exactly what we have seen before. So you might notice it's basically the same thing in here. It's still just um, um, data module main get chat history. And it's still the um, try except around it. The only thing that changed is that we are introducing something in here, those three lines and this line is new. So only these uh, four lines are basically added to the, uh, to the code. So what would be the intent of using a future? A future is a structure that takes a function as parameter. That's what we're seeing here. So we see a function as parameter that we hand over to a class function of ttask. The class function is future. So we are calling the, the function future and give it a function that it needs to execute at a certain point. And the future will take the function we hand over this one here and will execute it in a background task. So you might think, oh great, that's what I need. Sounds easy, but, well, let's think about it. It returns actually something which is very similar to what we received previously. So we get an object list of T chat message, and we need to hand over that type as a generic type into the future. It needs to know what to work with, what the result would be. So the result is our get chat history. It, that one returns just a... Um, that returns just an object list of T chat message. Okay, fine. Technically, L chat history is not now just uh, an object list. It's a little bit more. It's an I future. It's it's a hull for the actual uh, type we are returning. It, it's it's an interface, so we don't have to worry about freeing it up. And let's have a look how to work with it. So. I said the future will execute the code in this function in the background task, somewhere in the future. That's why the name is. So here we are back in the, in the main thread. In the main thread, we process the UI as previously and we get to this point. In this point, we have L chat history value. This value is something that the I future gives us and value is now of type T object list T chat message. So this line will now wait until the result of 
this function is ready to use. So the background thread will return the result and will have or will make this line or this call to L chat history value wait until the result is available. Okay, so let's see how that will work. Um, so we are going back to the form, change the code, and we have to go here and change that function or that procedure against uh, future. So let's compile it. There are errors. Well, there's something in my background running that uh, sometimes doesn't delete the or it doesn't let me override the executable. Don't worry about that. And well, let's run it. So the application compiles, runs. Well, this is something that shouldn't have. Oops, sorry. This is when you're doing live coding, but you might have seen already what happened. Let's do it again. Uh, okay. Okay. This is something that happens sometimes here. Just have to delete the old exe and now run it. Okay. So just let, oops, this shouldn't happen. Okay, power is on. And you have seen it actually didn't change the situation. It basically, um, it basically um, well, show the same situation. It basically uh, delayed the start of the, of the application by those same um, amount of time that we've seen previously. Let's double check with the, um, with the refresh button. So let me do that again with the refresh button. I didn't change that one here. So uh, sorry about that here. Okay, let's go to the um, refresh button, change that as well to see if that's basic, maybe just something that happens on the start of the, at the start up of the application. Um, so we add in future and run the application. Okay, have to leave the exe file. That happens, of course, when you do a live presentation. Okay, it's probably my virus checker or something that locks the exe file and run the application again. So at the start up, white screen, blank screen, so it means something is still operating, waiting in background, and we press the refresh button to see if it shows the same behavior. And yes, again, this one delays as well. So technically, well, we don't see any progress or advantage of using a future here. The, the reason is, well, <laughs> Don't worry about that. So there's something happening in the background here. Okay. Come on. Okay. We don't see a difference to what we have to what we did uh, previously. Why is that? Well, the reason is simple. We are doing stuff in the background, but this is basically just one operation running in the background. So, and at this point, we wait for this single operation to complete. So this really doesn't help here. Um, if you're using or going to use futures, it only makes sense if you have multiple operations that are fired off to run in, in the um, background. So let's say we had like two or three or five operations and you want to execute them at the same time. And when you come here, you want to continue only if all of them completed or whatever. So, the futures are interesting, but it's not easy to find a reason to use them in a way to avoid blocking the user interface. They are basically a different beast. So, it they doesn't um, basically doesn't uh, they don't um, solve the problem here. So, what to do? All right. So, what I have as a solution is refresh chat history task. So let's have a look here. Okay, I have it a little bit more. Ignore that for uh, at first. This is something I'm going to explain. And now we see here we still have the same 
structure. We have the try except here, and, and when we scroll down, we see here the same thing for um, well processing user interface. So it's basically the same code, just enhanced with some additional stuff. Additional stuff is t task again, but now we are using run. So we are trying to put something in the background by using a run command. This run command takes a anonymous method, which is here. This is the anonymous um, method uh, header. And we can just put in the code that we want to execute in the background. That's what, what's going to happen here. Now, you see, I have an exception handler here. So when something goes wrong with the connection, uh, it should show a message to the user. We could do that just here, but you see some code which look, might look weird at first. I have display status. This updates my user interface. So anytime you access the user interface, you have to run that through a synchronization process. Code that access or gets hold on the um, user interface needs to be synchronized to run in the main thread. You only may access the user interface from the main thread. And T thread Q means take this anonymous method down here and put it into the main thread and execute it. There is basically um, an additional uh, signature, T thread synchronize. You might heard of that one. So you could also do synchronize instead of queue. So where's the difference? Synchronize waits until the code which we put in or pass over by, by this anonymous method and waits for it to be executed. Queue instead, well, queues the code to be executed and returns immediately. So anytime you're thinking about, well, synchronize a queue, if, you're, if your code doesn't really rely on the fact that when you continue here that the code already ex ex is executed, then just use Q. Q is less, um, uh, the, the, it, Q causes a, uh, a lesser chance of running into a deadlock. Deadlocks might happen if, if you're in a situation where you wait for something to complete in the main thread and another um, operation does the same thing, you might run into a uh, deadlock. By using a queue or the queue command, you're basically, well, are less dependent on the main thread. That's why I'm using a queue here, because I just want to display a status if it happens now or half a second later, I really don't care. Well, race is just here to re-raise the um, exception. And if every, everything works fine, of course, we again need to, to run stuff through the queue. So thread queue means synchronize the following code into the main thread. And don't wait for it to be executed. So it will execute at a certain time of, uh, a certain point of time. So it updates the user interface again by processing the messages and um, putting them the, the content into the memo boxes we have down here. So this code, which is now marked here, will run in the main thread and it will block the main thread until it's done. So it's not some sort of, well, we are switch um, back to the main thread and have other code run. So it's really just running this code and then we'll go back to the main thread. So it's fully synchronized. You don't have to worry that something happens while processing or while in, in, in this processing of um, the user interface. It, it's not what you might have um, experienced when you run into problems with using timers or stuff which are 
maybe or maybe not re entrance stuff like that. This is code. This is really just uh, single threaded running in, in the main thread. So let's see how that works. Um, okay, sorry, I have of course to put that into the user interface at some point. So let's exchange the form show and make this task and of course the button as well. So call the uh, task variant here and just run it. Okay, I have to delete the axi again here, the old one. Uh, here we go. So run. And you see the user interface came up immediately. Now we just wait for the operation in the background to complete. And you see it, it just took a while to update the user interface, but the user interface was responsive in that time. So we can even go to refresh and you see refresh lets me move around. It doesn't block the user interface again. So this is what we want. We are using something um, Oops. We are using something in system threading that, that basically makes um, that basically makes um, working with background threads much more easy. You can take your existing linear code, which used to run in the main thread, and add just ttask run the procedure header, and then just look out for a code that might access your uh, user interface. That's the only thing that you need to be aware of. Here we are accessing the uh, user interface, which is why we need to t-thread queue or t-thread synchronize, depending on your needs. And again, down here, we just continue. Well, this is all accessing the user interface, so we put that one into a thread queue as well. All right, this is the basic idea of how to create applications that are using uh, t-task um, for creating background threads. Um, it's interesting to know that t-task, if, if you call it multiple times, maybe hundred times for doing little things in the background, it, it wouldn't create hundreds of threads. It, it's using a thread pool. The thread pool, the size of the thread pool is actually uh, calculated uh, depending on, on the number of cores of your system. And it also takes care that the um, that all background threads which are currently running are not consuming a hundred percent of your computing um, time, so that there is always at least a little computing time left over for the main threads to actually run. This is something which is done in in the um, thread pool, which is behind T thread. All right, I think um, David is now keen on showing some stuff um, which is. I'm uh, going to use uh, C sharp, uh, C++ directly, and it's almost the same, of course, in C++ syntax. David? We've shipped for some time uh, the threading unit or the T-thread class. It's in the systems class, systems classes area, and that's sort of the underpinnings of, of, uh, of what's going on. And then there's the system threading class, uh, a unit that we have as well. We'll get to that in a moment. I just wanted to bring up one of our old famous uh, sample applications that uh, that we've shipped in the past uh, threading. This was the famous threaded sorting demo. Uh, there's a little bit of history to this. Uh, not this version. This is the C++ version. Um, when we had what was it? C Builder 1 and then C Builder 3, we went from, and, and Delphi 1 to Delphi 2, we went from 16-bit windows in C Builder 1, Delphi 1, to 32-bit windows for Windows 95. And I was on the airplane from San Jose going up to Seattle to show our support for you know, threading and everything in Windows 95 at the launch on Microsoft's campus. And I realized that we didn't have a threading sample. 
uh, to demo in this little booth area in this tent on the lawn on Microsoft's campus where a bunch of uh, third-party vendors supporting Windows 95 were showing their things. And so on the plane, as I was flying up to Seattle, I wrote a very simple uh, threaded sorting demo that became and was cleaned up by R&D. I think it was Chuck Jadsky, uh, this threading sort demo that, we, that we've had around for a long time. And Charlie Calvert wrote about it in one of his books. And, you know, I just kind of quickly hacked together um, with some terrible code on the plane. But, uh, but it showed what was possible. This is the, you know, vastly cleaned up version, but it dates way back again to, to those early days. And what it is, it's a, thir a threaded sorting demo. It, it uses uh, uh, paint boxes here on Windows, the VCL application, to show the progress of a bubble sort, a selection sort, and a quick sort. And we know from our uh, numerical analysis programming and our computer science that uh, quick sort is faster than selection sort and bubble sort is the slowest, right? And we won't repeat sorting algorithms and, and how they work. Um, but under the covers, uh, it's just starting up, uh, you know, these different sorts. So here's my start on the start button click. I just say, okay, let's create a bubble sort, a T-bubble sort, and uh, and it has an array. And then we'll start the selection sort, and we'll start the quick sort. And then we want to set the on terminate for each of those to be thread done. And then the, the button gets enabled. And then under the covers, there is a code that actually executes the sorts. Uh, one of these allows you to set the name of the thread for debugging using the old ANSI string class and getting the class name. So whether it's the bubble sort class or the or the quick sort class or the uh, or the selection sort class. And I, I commented out this one, this T thread, because what I wanted to do was was take a look for a moment at the T thread class and see some of its options. And of course, one of those is to call execute, uh, to yield, um, to sleep, and so on. And this is the older T-thread class that we've had for a long time, uh, you know, synchronizing, checking, terminated, all of that. And then we have this higher level parallel programming library uh, that we've introduced that gives you much more functionality in the world of tasks, uh, uh, parallel fours and, and so on. Um, and so this application, I'll just run it um, so you can visually see what happens. It starts up a thread for each of the sort algorithms. First, we generate random numbers and, and do paint, line, paint lines so that you can see the values rather than just having a linear list of numbers, for example. And then we click Start Sorting. You can visually see the speed of each of these threads getting started and quick sorts faster, selection sorts next, and so on. If we go under, uh, in this covers, there's a, a synchronized, because we need to be able to swap so that we can paint in the paint boxes of each to, of the progress of the, of the sorts. So the visual swap uh, up here just lets us paint in the different whatever, uh, box for each sort, and we need to synchronize those set so that uh, because the VCL is not thread safe, so that we can uh, take the values of each of the lines and keep repainting them along the way. So that was the early days of, uh, of threading. And, and again, all of this is inside of the, the system classes HPP file, so synchronizes here. Uh, queuing things and so on, and then, uh, and you know, it's all part of the T-thread class. All right. So next incarnation of this now was to use the parallel programming library. So let's take a look at uh, at this one. There's there's two different versions of this. This uses a parallel four, and uh, so on the button click, I'm going to use use t the T-parallel class which is in the system threading library, systemthreading.hpp. And, uh, 
and then uh, we're going to use the parallel the four method as part of the parallel four. This takes several parameters. Uh, you know, if there's an owner, uh, uh, the beginning and end uh, iterator value, so one to max. In this case, max is fifty thousand, and then it 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 needs an iterator event, or that's one of the options is to pass something that has what looks like an event handler. It has a sender and it has the value of an index. So I declare my iterator event up here and give it that same under the cover signature. Uh, and then inside of this, I can run my method is prime passing the index. And the is prime is the same method I can use uh, whether it's a parallel prime number generator or on button one click, I just call is prime in a uh, in a sequential way, and that should take longer instead of firing up all the cores. And so this is the brute force uh, test for prime numbers to see if uh, if it's divisible by something, and if and if if it is, then it, and it's not a prime number, then break out and the, and return the bool as false. And so that on button one is the sequential version. Uh, fine, it runs. The the parallel version we call parallel four. So let me uncomment this out because I want to show you that parallel four has several different variations. So we can we can actually hit space and see things that are here. Uh, there's a loop state, loop resort, uh, iterator event. Um, you know. 64-bit precision or not, and then there's you know the rest of the constructors and so on. But there's that parallel four method. So let's go again and put four there and uh, and look at it. And then these are all the different variations for parallel four. Uh, and so there, it's an overloaded method where you can just pass an iterator event. Uh, that's the first one up there on the screen. Uh, there's some other. Uh, and there's the low and high values that we're passing to it. Uh, if you want to have a thread pool, you can pass that as an optional parameter at the end. Um, then down the way, there's uh, you can have a stride, which is how, how long things happen in which threads. It helps you identify uh, which parts of the parallel four are going to run in a certain thread or a couple of them in a thread and so on. You can also, there's an interface for for tasks, and we'll get to that in a minute. So there's different variations of things that are inside of the parallel four. And so let's just take a look at this. Oh, I should mention one other thing. There's this T interlocked class. And T interlocked uh, allows you in a, in a threaded application to do certain operations like increment uh, a value. And this, this tote is just a global variable defined in the form. We can go and look. It should be over there in the in the in the pub. In this case, it's in the public section. So uh, it's a form variable, and we can use that to increment the number of primes that we find. So if it is a prime, then we're going to update from any of the threads uh, that total value of primes found, and we use this interlocked. Class the increment method. So let me uncomment this for a moment, and we'll take a look at uh, at what we can do. So there's all sorts of methods in T interlock, increment, decrement. Uh, you know, do some testing, uh, exchanging values, adding a value, and then there's the rest of the the you know, things that involve instances and so on. So it's a nice little class that's that you can use inside of a thread to do things like uh, you know count numbers and so on add numbers together and such very simple and then you can extend it in the usual uh, inheritance way to add other kinds of functionality as well all right so let's take a look at this is the uh, VCL version so we'll uh, we'll just run this one and this one, I guess, is a 64-bit Windows version. So if I click on button one, it's going to run the sequential. and says, OK, out of 50,000 numbers, it found 5,134 primes, and it took 434 milliseconds. Clicking button two, which will run the parallel version, it said, OK, we found the same number of primes, but it took one-fourth of the time. It took 123 milliseconds. 
And again, depending on what's going on in my machine, I'm running in a VM where I have four cores assigned. My MacBook Pro has eight cores. Uh, in my VM here, I've, I've set it up to give uh, this Windows 10 VM four of those eight cores so that I can run other VMs and, and there do their thing. We can do the same thing in, uh, in FireMonkey. And so in FireMonkey, we can then run the application in uh, on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. And this is just the same application. The only difference is that uh, it's using a FireMonkey form. Uh, but it's used the same code. I've got my memo. I've got my buttons, the exact same code. Here's the sequential version, uh, again, for the loop. And here's the, the parallel version. So this one, let's just run on, uh, we can run this on OS 10, for example, if I start up my PA server. Let's uh, make sure that's running. And the first time you run it after you start up, uh, you have to tell the Macintosh that it's okay for this process to, to get at the tools API. So my IP address may have changed for my connection. Let's copy that and let's go back to uh, our ID and let's make sure our connection is correct. Okay, it looks like it's the same. I'll just, just to be sure, test the connection. It's all good. All right, so the same code this time, FireMonkey, again, the parallel programming library and tthread uh, class, all of those are available across all the platforms that we support. So let's go and uh, build this one for OS 10. Make sure it's all okay. And then we'll say, okay, linking, that's all good. And let's say run. And then it should switch over. And everybody sees that. So now I've got my for loop here and it found 5,134 primes. That's good. And in this case, I'm not in my VM. I'm, I've got all the cores so it can run even faster right all right and then but it still finds the right primes that's a good one that's a good thing and then finally I wanted to show and I showed this the other day um, this is using the task run and the t task uh, class and I'm passing a, a lambda uh, into the run and then inside of here, I'm doing a thread synchronize. And the reason I, and I pass a lambda to that one because I want to, inside of this uh, task run, I want to be able to update the user interface to say, is it working or is it done? Uh, the capture variables I need to, to pass into the lambda, the this pointer so it can know about memo one, uh, that is in the user interface and the iterator here uh, I I need to pass that in so that I can do the test of what's going on uh, right there and so this example can run on it's a fire monkey example it can run on uh, on all the different platforms and then I have button 2 which is not in the task run and it's just going to output the current value that I am uh, updating along the way. And the value is being updated inside of the, the task run, for, it's, uh, the for loop inside of the task run. And the value is defined over in the, in the class. And it's just, in this case, I put it in the private um, to protect it from other, uh, other code. All right. Now, I, I commented out the t-task here again because I wanted to go and show you what's available on the t-task. Uh, so we have run. We can wait for any other tasks that might be running. If we start up multiple tasks, wait for any of those at the end of some logic. We can also wait for all. There's, I think if I, there's run, of course, and that takes a sender and it takes a, uh, uh, a, a notify event and and a, which is an, a task interface and that allows me to use the lambda that that declaration so wait for any and I think there's a wait for all down here so we can do a wait for all we can see what the current task is we can go and check the status 
of each of the tasks, for example, and see are the, is it running, is it is it stopped, is it completed. So you have all of that uh, capability just in the T task uh, class itself. And in this case, I'm using the again the run method. So let's uh, run this one. Win32 is fine. Um, just so we can watch. So here we're just showing the value, right? We're just hitting and clicking the, the show value, but let's run the background task. Now it's running and sleeping, working away. That's, that's that uh, call to thread synchronize so we can write to the user interface. Show value is just dumping out, uh, oh, three times. Okay, that's fine. I, I was playing around with this program. And then it's all done. Uh, that was done up here when it completed and went through all of the iterations it wanted to do, in this case, five, and uh, and we see the final value. So just wanted to show you uh, some C++ parallel examples, the old school just using T-Thread, and then the, the newer parallel programming library, which is in the system threading unit. And you should, you should check the system threading unit out, the HPP file. Uh, the parallel programming library is implemented in, in Delphi, but it's accessible uh, from C++. And you can build you know, reactive and interactive user interfaces, as, as Olaf was mentioning, um, by using these, these, these thread classes and the threading library um, to build uh, more responsive applications. So let me switch microphones again, and we'll go check the Q&A log. OK. Uh, is T-Task usable in other situations as IoT apps where devices could answer at different speeds? Sure, you can use, uh, since the parallel threading library uh, and T-Task run and so on, um, you could have different tasks running. You can create an array of tasks, for example, and you could have them running, and you could have a main logic that would um, that would just check the status of threads. Uh, you could update flags by using the the synchronize, for example, or uh, or using t you know t interface. So um, you could have those different threads saying, hey, I've got some data from an IoT device. Um, if you're monitoring multiple uh, devices or, or states, it could be communication applications waiting for data coming from different channels and so on. So absolutely, uh, you could use that not just in IoT, but anything that wants to um, run a separate task and then let your application know they've got something, they've completed some work. That's what T-Tasks, you know, you're running a task, complete some work or that you got the data you need and, and go and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and have your programming going. Uh, and I will zip up these examples, absolutely. Uh, the parallel example we ship is a Game of Life. This is a very old Scientific American article. And so that is a very complete uh, and interesting application. But I'll uh, zip all these little examples up, these prime number things and so on. A uh, thread demo, I think, still ships uh, with the samples from way back when. Um, and, and the question, Michael has a question, why are you using Lambda and T-Test Run? Is it also possible without Lambda? And the answer is yes. I was using a Lambda just to show that you can pass a Lambda in. Uh, but you could have uh, just some logic, you know, another method or, uh, that you would call. And inside that method, um, you could then uh, do whatever work you want to do in that. Uh, and I think I showed that in the prime number. Well, that was the parallel four. But you could have in, in run just one of the parameters. You should take a look in the doc wiki and in the system.threading.hpp file. There are other options as I flash them up, uh, parameters you can pass to run. Uh, in, the, in my case, I wanted to pass uh, a, a method to it, and so I used a lambda, but I, as you saw in, uh, in the prime number, I could also pass a, a, an event uh, signature or, or external method as well. So I just wanted to show the lambda because we now have C++11 for Win32, Win64, 
um, iOS and Android. Uh, and it's nice because then you, when you want to do something small, you can do it right in line. But otherwise, you can you can pass uh, a, a, some other method uh, as well. So it was a way of showing both a method and a lambda. But uh, you can use the you can use the parallel programming threaded library in uh, in our you know in all of the compilers that support uh, the the multi device or even VCL as you saw just Windows only. Okay. And yeah, what I'll do is I'll do a blog post and I'll I'll put the sample code in Code Central. So and Brian, I'll get Brian to add it to his uh, collation of resources for the different talks. So I'll uh, I'll work on zipping this all up uh, today and get that out on Code Central. Okay, uh, I think those are all the questions. Olaf, anything to add on your end um, before we? Uh, end and launch it. Well, uh, you, you you explained everything very nicely, so um, I don't really see anything else. Important to note is it's really convenient to use those t-task um, methods. Um, it's just there is no excuse anymore to have not your application multi-threaded um, like in the old days. That's really what what the message is now. 